In this video we'll talk about China. Our guest today is Michael Michelini from Global from Asia. He lives in Asia for several years and he has really good insights about this country. In the conversation we'll talk about product packaging. You will learn what is a white box and black box in terms of packaging and uh, Mike uh, gives us a lot of really interesting tips on how to start your Amazon private label business with your own logo by not investing too much in the branding. And in the second part of this video, we'll talk about how to talk and communicate with your supplier and uh, factory in China. And as always, if you like videos like this, where we talk to different Amazon experts and software providers, don't forget to subscribe below to the YouTube channel of Orange Click. Click the notification bell as well. And now, enjoy this conversation. Hello, Mike. It's nice to have you here. And uh, today in this conversation, we will also have another guest, which is uh, Lisette Lis. She works with different Amazon stores and... Uh, Today we'll talk about China, sourcing from China, uh, Chinese culture. But before we move on, could you, Mike, introduce yourself, what you do in Amazon space and uh, how you help Amazon sellers? Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks, Gustav, for uh, in inviting me. In Basically, yeah, my name is Michael Michelini. Uh, I'm an American citizen in China, and I've been selling online through, started on eBay 2004. and of course, moved to Amazon as everybody did, and later on, but moved to China 2007 for sourcing for my own business. I did bar supplies, kitchen and bar supplies for many, many years, and then I uh, also helped others sourcing from China. And I've the host at Global from Asia. Also, like to do community things and networking. And what I've been doing really, my my main passion is content creation, content marketing for Amazon sellers. I, I recently uh, started a new brand in Amazon. We we built it up from China, you know, from markets, uh, factories. We even did some of it publicly on uh, on some bogs, and and recently emerged it with uh, Alpha Rock Capital, which is an investment company for Amazon businesses in based in uh, it's a U.S. company with a Philippines office. But yeah, so mostly content creation and product development in in, in Asia, China, Asia. Great. So let's start from the beginning. Do you have do you have any kind of new ways of uh, I don't know sourcing products in China in 2020 and uh, coming years? Maybe something is changing or everything is the same like before. Uh, yeah, I think things are they're oh, like, like if if things are not changing, they're dying, right? So I think things are definitely changing. Um, I think one of the biggest trends since I first came to China was then they. I met some eBay sellers in 2007, but there was never, there was not like this huge Chinese seller community that uh, exists now there. Um, so of course, there's so many people that are in China selling online already, selling on Amazon, selling on uh, different places, but they do still have the, the need for branding. Uh, they still have, they still, some do want to have overseas partners, overseas distributors. So I think, I've been saying it for maybe a year or two, and I could talk about it a lot, but I think there's more partnership approaches with, with Chinese companies, Chinese factories, Chinese brands, Chinese sellers. You know, I know that it's difficult in any any business um, to have equity shareholders, especially in cross-cultural, you know, uh, situations, but I hope I could inspire or give some people some ideas for some strategic alliances, strategic formations with uh, with Chinese um factories and sellers okay so you started like in 2007 with your first like sourcing uh, uh task or you did sourcing for your own company so what has been like the biggest change uh, so far sure i mean i moved in 07 i was still working in new york it was 2006 i think was my first buy from china you know probably like many of you were searching on you know alibaba global sources Going on Skype at night in the U.S. to China time, uh, I had no idea what I did was doing. You know, basically, I um, I think they didn't know either. It was not as developed the communication platforms, the technology solutions, the access to information. So I I really think back then um, I'm going to make some people laugh, but I didn't even know what a brand really was in in 2007. Of course, I knew, but I. 
I was selling on Amazon and I was making ASINs and I was making listings, but I didn't even know what to put for the brand because I would buy products from China with no logo. There was no private label. Private label wasn't even a word, I think, then. You know, people were, most of the people I knew were just buying generic on eBay and uh, Amazon. I remember I even talked to some Amazon seller support and they're saying, you should put your brand on it. I'm like, brand? I'm like, because I didn't know, I put like a generic word for the manufacturer because I was like, what do I put for the manufacturer? You know, I didn't know anything. So back then it was, nobody had any idea, idea what they were really doing with factories and branding and packaging. You know, back then everything was just in poly bags, white boxes. I, I feel like now the branding, the packaging, the bundling has really what I've seen develop, you know, especially Amazon listings. They're just so professional now. You know, you have to spend money on the listing optimization experts and professional photo studio, professional video you know, back then it was like a really kind of not so good photo. I remember I had to, I took them on the floor of my, uh, in New York. I, I had them on my studio apartment and I'm taking pictures with like a Canon digital camera and uploading them to Amazon, you know, like, <laughs> so I feel like it's gotten obviously much more competitive, much more mature, much more important for packaging, branding, um, you know, the whole experience, the whole branding experience. Let's talk a little bit uh, more practical information. So uh, maybe uh, especially for beginners, when they start, they have a product idea and the only thing they know is probably Alibaba and AliExpress. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is your suggestion? How to start this product uh, up approaching, I know, the manufacturers or producers of these uh, uh, products they're interested. So is it a good place to go to Sale Express? Do you have some tips like maybe sure. how to communicate later to them and what to write sure. and how to negotiate? I think the big question is, as always, numbers talk, money talks. Uh, I respect the hustle. I, I mean, I've been, I'm an entrepreneur still. I, I, I think for the rest of my life, I'll be a hustling, bootstrapping entrepreneur. So I understand the game, but you have to think about your for those watching right now, how much are you willing to invest in product? I mean, that's, I think, the big question you need to ask yourself. Um, I think, I think don't lie to the factory. Don't say you're going to order a huge amount if, if you don't plan to. You know, I know that might be a bargaining tactic. You go high and then you come down and say, Oh, I just want a small quantity to sa sample. I, I don't recommend kind of that kind of game. Um, but I think the question is, what's your quantity you willing to buy? So, one tip, of course, uh, I've I've ordered from AliExpress, Alibaba. Um, it's a little bit tricky if you're trying to sell it on Amazon because you want. I usually do my own listings. I like to do private label, so I want to have my. I want to own the list buy box. I don't want to be. Uh, I don't want to be retail arbitrage. I don't. I don't want to be on just fighting for the buy box. So I'm. Bu I'm making my own brands. So that's a little bit more tricky and more obviously more investments of product or investments in you know contents of photos and the the, the reading. But I think the biggest tip I would say to give a really practical tip is, like I mentioned earlier about the white box and the uh, poly bag. If you're going to get a small quantity, they're not going to do custom packaging. But the best hack or the best tip is to get a sticker and put a sticker of your brand on the white box. So that, that I hope is a really practical one. I learned that. So even, even when I do a small order right now, I just have stickers at like a sourcing agent's company in, in China. And then they just have a sticker. And then I just tell the factory, give me a white box. I don't, I don't like to use their packaging. Sometimes they have some kind of really chinglish packaging. I'd rather have no packaging or a white box than to have those commodity, you know, bad English uh, language uh, boxes. So I like that would be my best tip is to get stickers and get white box, ask them for white box and put your own brand sticker on the package. And the sticker, you mean uh, like the kind of the, which is covering all the box with a, let's say brand with the barcodes and with some descriptions. No, no. I mean, I, I'm just saying like a f straight white box, you know, like, and then just have one side of it, a sticker, like, uh, it's really kind of ghetto, I know, but uh, it still looks okay. I mean, of course, it's not the ideal, but this is kind of like a, what I would say if you're on a limited budget and you want to have your own branding experience in Amazon or on eBay or whatever you're selling, 
it's still better than using their packaging and it's better than using a pure white box. So just having on hand like uh, stickers is, and try to make the sticker so it could be used for different types of uh, package sizes. So, or you can have a few different sizes of stickers. The other hack, the other hack is, um, I don't have it on me, but I would also make my own canvas bags. I'd make my own uh, packaging that would be about the average size of my average product. So I would make like a drawstring canvas bag so I could put my product inside of it and then I could like put that as an additional uh, piece with my product. So these are both different hacks because I really think packaging is important. One, for the, brand, the user experience when they receive the product, it looks like it's your product, not like some Chinese uh, product, which it technically still is, but uh, it's kind of a hack. And then the other one would other benefit is photos for your product listing. So you could put the packaging, the sticker, you could put your logo, you could have the, the, the canvas bag or the, and they're really cheap, you know, you could just, and you could, just, so you try to make it so you can use it across as many different ASINs or as different products as possible. And then you can do small quantities with the factories um, or markets. And then you would have maybe a shipping company or a, your um, different companies, maybe a sourcing agent or a, a freight forwarder or there's prep companies that would prep it. Usually you prep it in China too. You could prep it in, in the destination country, but there's there's Chinese companies that are Amazon preps, so they could prep it for you. So there's a, I, I don't know if you want to talk about the different options, but basically having this on hand and uh, it'll give you better product photos and a be better brand experience for your customers. I really like this hack because uh, especially for beginners, you are, you know, puzzling how to make branding on your first product, which we just want to test. You don't want to order 500 with a logo so you can just order without logo and put your logo yeah. on the package. Oh, it's nice. Yeah. Another hack, another tip. You could put your logo on the actual product, even for low quantities. The factory won't do it, but you could get it etched on if it's metal. You can do it for like even 100 pieces um, with a third party. Usually a sourcing company can help you or a trading company can help you, but they could usually, it's done after the product's made, so it doesn't have to be high MOQs, but they could etch it on. The only hard part is it has to be on a flat part of the product. It can't be on like a curved part. When it gets curved, that's when it's usually got to be done on mass production. But if you can find a flat part of the product, like one one of the – I did coffee products and uh, one of them I had to put it on the bottom of the pot because I, the top was too round for us to etch etch it. It's like an etching. So I, it's not the best, but I, I can put it on the bottom. And then you could actually put it, if your logo is on a product, you can definitely get away with the picture of your product with your brand on it because it's part of the product. But the, if you can't do that, you can do it on the packaging. And then you use the packaging in the photo and the listing. What are yeah. some of the examples you have seen for, let's say, for more expensive packaging options? Like uh, I know sellers can get really creative. So what is the most creative packaging you have seen? I mean, sometimes the packaging is more more expensive than the product, if, especially on those accessory items. Um, but some of the better packaging, honestly, I I, I also want to note, I try to be eco friendly in your packaging. Some you, I I think that spe especially with the you know the world is now with the pollution in the world and the you know this all these bad things happening with uh. I think you should also think about eco-friendly packaging, you know, so, and also use that on your listing. So I, I just want to bring that up as well, make sure people realize that. So you can also be using the package as part of the product. So it's a reusable box or a reusable part of the product. So it adds a higher perceived value. And you can also say like, um, we, we, you know, you could use this whole story in your listing and your packaging your email follow-ups that uh, we we care for the earth we uh we use really eco-friendly packaging reusable packaging um like i mentioned i did bar supplies and like one really popular product is a bartending kit in that niche 
So honestly, if you look at bartending kit on Amazon, it's really competitive. And it's almost always the same products lined it, but it's got a different like case. And it's like a you use your packaging to stand out in your listing. So you use like a bright blue box, you know, and it's like metal and it kind of opens up, you know, and it's it's got uh, all the different holds for the spoon and the opener and the, the shaker. And the idea is you can actually put that on your bar, right? So the packaging becomes part of the product where you see these cheaper ones on the listings and they have no packaging or... And if you read the negative reviews, sometimes you'll say the packaging was ripped and it was really cheap and the, 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 you know, the spoon ripped right out the top because it was thin cardboard and it was a lot of times the packaging actually also affects the, uh, delivery of the product. So it's also maybe it won't shake as much. I've had a horrible experience with the coffee pots. The handles of the pot smash was too loose and it wasn't braced up against. So it, it, I think a forklift smashed a whole bunch of them because it snapped, it snapped the handle right off of the mocha pot. And, uh, we had to do a recall from Amazon. It was horrible. Uh, we just, it was like over eight or 9% return rate of smashed handles. So yeah, you also want to make sure that it's a good way to protect your product from, from shipping too. Um, but the craziest would be like these high, heavy metal cases for your bartender, you know, kits um and the product case becomes more than the accessories we also want to talk about the new world the new the new future is people should be more aware of the environment so i would say i would try to make it eco-friendly packaging and eco-friendly product um and that could be done through the material that could be done by making the packaging useful and reusable and part of the product um but yeah the big problem with packaging is it does get thrown away. So when you're making your packaging design, try not to make too much waste because it's kind of sad. You know, you see somebody rip open the box and then it's, a, it's probably like this big and it's like a box this big. and It's got styrofoam and it's got plastic and, you know, so I do want to say maybe if that's a you know, kind of wrapping up thing is don't don't kill the earth on packaging. I know packaging does look nice on your listing, but. You know, you also want to use the packaging in your listing photos, in your branding experience, because also you can't really put your logo, your you can't put watermarks on your product. Yeah, very interesting. I enjoyed this conversation about packaging. So what would be your suggestions uh, for people sourcing in China? How to organize package packages, packaging, all the material and the design? Can uh, the do of factories in China provide such service or you know some agents which can help with sure. that or it's better to do it at home again i hate to hold it depends but i guess it depends on your size your volume your budget um so there's some things to think about um i don't know if you people know what the idea of black box is uh, but basically the idea of black box is you almost don't want your factory to have your packaging because so the definition of black box, I learned this also in China, was you don't buy all the pieces from the same factory, even if you can. You purposely buy, you know, like we talk about bartender kit, you pur purposely buy like the opener from one factory, the shaker from another, the packaging from another, and then you ship it to an assembly uh, place. Um, and then that one would receive all the products and package it together for you and then send it to the customer uh, or to send it to Amazon, prep it and send it. So there's uh there's plenty of agents of course I know um that's you know I, that's my world uh I don't personally do it as a service but I have many friends that do uh in the industry so usually usually that can be done by a sourcing agent it could be done by a prep company you know it could be done by the logistics company it's usually one of those three categories of uh types of service providers they usually all are willing to do it and they usually charge an extra fee um but I, I almost recommend it because what's, what happens when you actually do start to do vault, the sticker is probably not the biggest deal, but even the sticker, because if you give your factory your sticker, you give them usually the editable source files, the high res, and then that's where you start to see your copies on Amazon and eBay because you're giving the factory everything. You're like, here's my product design. Here's my packaging. Here's my logo in high res AI file, you know, uh, and, and then, or they could even just 
change some of it. You know, they could just change change it and put their brand on it. And so it's almost better. But of course, it costs more. It costs more, right? So it's cheaper to do one factory, give them everything. And the factory usually says, oh, oh, let's say you don't need to contact that sourcing agent. They charge extra money. You can save money. You can work with me. I can take care of everything. I won't charge you extra. Don't worry about it. Well, there is a reason they want to kind of keep you as a customer too. You know, it's not only for bad. It's also they're trying to just be a good service provider, but also is really dangerous because they have all of your IP, all of your, your, your stock, you're stuck with them. So, um, so that's the thought process, right? Do you do it with the factory? Do you do it with a service provider? Do you do it in your home country? You know, do you send it to your apartment and, in Spain and then do it, you know, anything is possible. But usually what people do is use like a sourcing agent. Um, I'm always hesitant to recommend on a, on a, on, a, on here. I could give you some to add to the notes, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's different service providers with different rates and different ways they work. Sometimes they charge a percentage of the fee, you know, a percent on top of your order. Sometimes they charge like a per item fee. Sometimes they charge like a, a service fee like, um, you know, like a QC company would do $200, $300, $400 per mandate to go to the factory and check. That's QC. But then packaging, usually they charge like a per item fee. You know, it's like, it's, I'm afraid to say a price, but, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously cheaper to do it in China. And the other benefit of doing packaging in a QC company or they do QC when they do it because they're packaging it for you. So they're taking it out of the... They're looking at the product, right? So they're looking at the product and they're fixing, you know, putting a sticker on it. So you can also say, hey, when you take it out, can you also like, you know, test it or look at it or see that it's not scratched, check it for scratches? You know, so this also can be like a quality control process of the packaging. So uh, you're knowing a little bit of the background of how how would things work in Chinese culture? Let's say if a seller still decides to use uh, one factory to produce the product as well as the packaging, can there be like any agreement between the seller and the factory regarding, let's say, the packaging files or designs that would uh, not allow factories to use it again or or modify? Because I know I'm that's the question seller. Allowed. That's, 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 that's yeah, but that's a question uh, that a lot of uh, beginner sellers have because they they are eager to design their packaging, their product insert sheets, like everything. And then the what factories usually do, they ask for the source files. Of course, you give them everything because you don't know, and you think they actually need those things for for like printing everything out. So I have seen sellers asking this question. So perhaps you can tell your opinion and. and what you know about it i'm sorry I, I don't want to laugh but it's it's funny to me i mean i'm i'm just getting old you know uh i mean there's really nothing you can do that's the best thing you can do is don't give them as much information as possible that's honestly the best way is don't give them everything you know and i know the tra- i know this i know obviously i've and this is why we're talking about this. I know this story. I know the chat on Alibaba. I know the Skype chat. I know the Canton Fair discussion in the booth. They say they can do it. They can do it. It's faster for them to do it. It's easier for them to do it. It's true. It's cheaper. It's it's true. It's true. It's true. And I do it. Honestly, I can't say I don't do it. I've also given this to certain factories. So I can't say I haven't done it, but you can't think you're protected. You can't think that you can do something to stop them from doing something to you. You can't think that. You just can't. I've gone through, I've tried to sue a factory. We can talk about that. I've, I, uh, basically just gotta trust them. And you can't think there's any way you can stop them from doing something. What you're saying is that uh, their business culture is a bit different than what we understand, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I have a I'm married. My wife is Chinese, you know, so I I understand the thinking, and uh, you know, I don't want to say it in a bad way. I think Chinese people would would agree with me. It's just, it's just. it's like a game. Business, I guess it's like a game, right? But business is like a game and it's all about positioning and strategy. And in Chinese business, 
from what I've learned is you always have to have an upper hand. You always have to have something that they can't, you, if they know they have everything, then you have very little bargaining power. I mean, that's true in any business relationship, right? But especially I feel like in China, you have to always have some kind of a leverage. You always have to have something to keep them like, you know, uh, dependent on working with you. If they feel like you're just a middleman and they're, they don't need you, then they'll, they'll, they'll just say it's just business. It's like, it's just business. Maybe it's true in the Western world, but they'll just feel like, Mike, you're, I've gotten cut out. And I've, they tell me this to my face, you know, maybe not with an Amazon product, but in business deals, they're very about, it's, uh, you know, they're very just saying like, if, if you're not doing anything in the value chain, they'll just try to cut you out. And that's just China business. It's just trying to cut out the middle, middleman. Like my wife calls real estate agents middlemen. You know, I guess a middle real estate agent is a middleman, right? So you look for an apartment and then you're, you're trying to think about how to cut out the middleman. This is just baked in the... So as soon as you look like you're not adding value and not needed, that's when you're in real big trouble. Okay. Do you have any tips or, or what sellers should follow in order to build like a really good and trustworthy relationship with the factories and, and the suppliers? Yeah. I mean, I think um, there's a few strategies and I, I don't... I want to give tactics, so I don't want to say lie, but there's some things you can think about. You can try to not you want to have a good cop, bad cop kind of relationship. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're, you're the one that's saying no to them. You don't want to. So a good way to do it is there's two ways you can think about it. One, you could not be the boss and you could be the worker of your company, even if you are the worker, even though you are the boss. So you could contact them and say, I'm, I'm the sourcing agent for the company. Um, and I've done that for my own sourcing, my own business. So I, it's kind of true, right? I was in China. I set up my own sourcing company and I was sourcing for my own e-commerce brand. So I would use my sourcing company as the company with them. And I would not really show them my brand or my e-commerce company until I had to. I mean, that's a very, a little bit more advanced, but the, the more basic is when you contact them on Alibaba, you don't say I'm the CEO and owner and sole founder and only decision maker. You say either one, if you don't want to lie, you say you have partners or you have advisors, which I think is true for negotiating anywhere, whether it's in China or anywhere. You don't want to say you're the only one that makes a decision, I think, at least. Um, and the second is you might say I'm the worker of the company. And that way, when you're bargaining with them, you can say, ah, oh, I don't want to joke, but a lot of times you get to talk to the a uh, 25-year-old business graduate what, female that has business English degree that's hired by the factory to be a sales rep. And they're the ones you're talking to on Alibaba or Global Sources. You're not talking to the factory. Usually a factory owner doesn't speak English. So you're usually talking to the sales girl. It's usually a girl. I'm sorry. My wife calls my, – my wife and my mom call me like a uh, sexist or something when I talk about this sometimes. But usually it's a female sales girl that you're going to talk to on on these – factories norm uh, 90% of the time i talk to a female so they so then they're like trying to sell to you they're adding you on wechat they're adding you on skype they're emailing you they're going to be trying to sell you their product they're going to be following up with you so you might want to say oh my boss or oh my partner or oh my advisor or oh my investor so you want to kind of be in the middle you don't want to be the one saying no to them cuz especially in china saying no is a very negative thing I think it's true anywhere, but especially in China, you're like, no, that, that, that's like a negative. And then the other bigger, more advanced tip is to actually be a sourcing company. So sometimes I make a fake, <laughs> I don't want to say fake, a Gmail account or a separate company. If, if you're really advanced, like kind of, I was like, when I first came to China, I made my sourcing company Shadstone, it's still Shadstone actually. And then I would have my, my import company. My, my e-commerce company was, it's actually not around anymore, but New York Bar was my brand at that time. But so I would use my sourcing company and that email, and then I would go to trade shows as a sourcing company. And of course, it's a little bit more advanced, but maybe you could, you could say you're a sourcing company. And a really big hack uh, is, um, I talk about this sometimes in sessions, is the U.S. Import export data is public since 2001 Patriot Act when uh, the September 11th attacks happened. They made all import data public. 
So sometimes the government, I mean, your competitors can see that. I can see who is buying from which factory. And there's even startups, tech companies that have made businesses, SaaS services on top of this. Like importgenius.com is a popular one. You have to pay like 70 bucks a month. I think Jungle Scout has this now. So you could actually, that's very advanced, but you could be the exporter of record from a Hong Kong or Chinese company. That's very advanced, but you could also have a different importer. You could have a different company that's importing than your seller account, which is still advanced because you have multiple companies. But just be aware that the companies you are somewhat public, at least in the U.S. import export data, it's, uh, it's public. So the company you put on the exporter will be recorded and importer will be recorded for that product. Uh, so you want to have a ex- another company so that your competitors can track, kind of, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've actually sourced products from my competitors. Great. I like these tips and hacks. Very nice. Very A lot of interesting information. So you said you don't provide any services, but uh, if some people want to learn more uh, what you know and to get some advice, I know you have a podcast, right? You have some, yeah, yeah. also you create content. Maybe you can tell the websites yeah. where can people find you. Sure, sure. So I have a, a weekly podcast over 300 shows at Global from asia.com gfa and uh yeah it's, it's more around asia asia business trading and you know i also you know have a membership there for people usually it's a little bit asia based uh people but if you want to connect with those uh people in you know china vietnam other but usually it's westerners in asia so that's kind of our small club <laughs> and what uh, do people get in your membership site so we have monthly calls, forums. Uh, I have a few courses about China manufacturing uh, and also some Amazon, uh, you know, courses for launching. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Lisette. And bye-bye. Good luck in your business. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I helped. I do hope you enjoyed and got some useful tips about China, Chinese culture. If you want to get in touch with Michael, check his uh, links below in the description. And now, if you would like to learn more about China, check this video, which uh, is uh, shown here on the screen. And see you in the next video. And don't forget to subscribe below to the YouTube channel of Orange Click. Bye bye.